Thank you, uh, Stuart. It's, my, uh, my pleasure. Uh, very you. nice uh, meeting you. And as Laurent Vallée was saying earlier, uh, he was joking about this uh, 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 title, Propaganda and Democracy, uh, and, and the fact that these two words, although they seem uh, antagonistic and, and contrary, uh, are not that unrelated. Uh, and, uh, and, and all your work and all... Um, what we've seen in the, in the documentary show that. Um, we are in a different world today, um, or we think we are in a different world uh, from Edward's uh, time. Uh, is it really a different world? Uh, I mean, who, who would be, what would be his reaction if he came back today? He died uh, uh, when he was over 100 years old. He was 102. And 102. Uh, so he, he, he had no real um, uh, involvement in the g digital era. But what would, who, what would be his, his reaction if he saw today's world with algorithm, with big data, with all uh, the technology that has invaded uh, every uh, area of life? Well, I think we're filled with ideas that everything is new. This is partly a product of wanting to feel that we are making some form of movement in life. Uh, it's also part of the way in which the media, particularly the news media work, which is particularly with we having a 24-hour news cycle, uh, part of what the media do is that they rely on every day being new. That's why they call it news. And, um, and uh, uh, the result of that is that it tends to, at the same time that it promotes a fascination with the novelties of the present, it also obliterates and each, each day consumes the previous day's news and it generates a kind of historical amnesia which I think may stand in the way of our ability to see Edward Bernays uh, riding on a horseback in, uh, within our midst. Uh, um, Bernays, I think, would feel very pleased um, that the technologies, for example, that are being used with big data in order to uh, diagnose people's uh, inner feelings uh, through their behavior online, he would feel well, this is what I was looking for. Um, uh, back in the 1920s, I was concerned with understanding, first of all, what are the motivations that drive the public or the masses. I was also interested in understanding the, there's a French sociologist from the turn of the century named Gabriel Tard who wrote about opinion and conversation. And one of the things he said, this was 1898, he said, uh, people sit around a table and they're having a conversation. Um, but, uh, and they believe that they're just the two or three of them having a conversation. But in fact, the, no, the role of journalism and the role of the media have reached such a point that their conversations are no longer their own. They're, their minds and their words are following what he called the grooves of their borrowed thoughts. And I think uh, uh, so very early on, Bernays was somebody who was looking for the railroad tracks, so to speak, or the networks along which perception follow through society. Uh, the use of big data, which has become uh, a, a key word of the present, uh, a key phrase of the present, is simply a refinement of something that Bernays was looking for in more primitive terms, say, um, when he began his work in the, during, during the First World War. So, so you believe that the, the fundamentals of his uh, thinking, his uh, theory, uh, are still there, and, and that all we have changed is the, the tools, the scale, the uh, ability to reach into people's minds and, and behaviors. Uh, 
but not, not that, that it hasn't changed fundamentally the way things are. In other words, if you're looking what the motivations are and what the strategies are, um, uh, they have not changed except that the tools have changed. Um, uh, but I, I think what's interesting, I mean, uh, 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 Jimmy talked before about how Brene's book, Propaganda, was just published in France within the last 10 years. Uh, it, I should add that it was just republished in the United States within the last 10 years. Brene's was a name, even though, <laughs> there's a story I learned when I was a student that uh, Beethoven and and the philosopher Hegel were standing at the side of this road and Napoleon rode by on a horse and uh, Hegel turned to Beethoven and he said, we are witnessing the world's spirit on horseback. And Beethoven never spoke to Hegel again. <laughs> um, I think that Bernays in many ways represented the world's spirit of the invisible wire pullers who are interested in sort of managing not so much public consent, but uh, I, I was saying just when we were sitting over a table before, um, the, ma the manufacture of consent is in certainly too gentle a way of putting it because I think what it is about is the manufacture of obedience. And I think this is so, uh, this is something that's an ongoing part of our world, and certainly within the United States, uh, there's no way of understanding Trumpism um, uh, uh, without understanding it as the product of the manufacture of obedience. We will we, come to, to Trump, obviously. Yes. <laughs> He's a big part of our uh, uh, discussion. But to, to continue on, on, on that uh, aspect, uh, when the internet and the, and the tech companies started, they were seen as tools of, of freedom, of liberation, of uh, changing this paradigm that, that uh, uh, you were describing. Uh, and, and, and particularly when you think of uh, Google's motto, do no, no evil. Um, how come we didn't see that um, at the beginning? Um, this is a complicated question because uh, the internet was developed by the US military. It was not developed simply by a bunch of freedom seekers. Um, and um, uh, there's a, a book that has recently come out in the United States, the title of which has escaped my old mind, um, uh, uh, which deals with this sort of strange interrelationship between militarism and the uses of the internet. Um, uh, but I, uh, yes, I mean, I think what a lot of people saw was that the internet created the, the, the public square once again, where everybody could participate in discussions. These were fundamental to the ideas of democracy as they evolved in the in the 18th century, um, here in the United States and elsewhere, but I would say France and the United States very much so. Um, the difference, of course, is that the internet is a public square of isolated individuals. And so the relationship between that public square and the possibility of public awareness as a public and public discussion and public activism uh, is complicated because you have people sitting in front of their screens witnessing, his witnessing history in a very isolated kind of way. So at the same time that it offered the possibility of a kind of interaction that was previously unimagined, um, it also created an increasingly insular and isolated an individuated public, which I think represents a tremendous problem in terms of our future. But who would be the Edouard Bernays of today? Would he be a, a computer engineer who designs algorithms? 
you know, one of the reasons why Edward Bernays is of interest and got translated to French in the last 10 years and has been translated into uh, English, has been published again in English within the last year, 10 years in the United States, along with another, his earlier book, which was called Crystallizing Public Opinion, um, which came out in 1923. Um, uh, one of the reasons why Bernays is being republished is because he speaks to the current generation. That is to say, um, I know a lot of young people who are involved in contemporary forms of persuasion and influence, um, who go back to Bernays as, in many ways, the, you want to talk about the Pope, uh, you know, as the primate of the, uh, the holy primate of persuasion. He, uh, one of the reasons why Jimmy's film resonates today is because in many ways Bernays is, as I said before, he's the world spirit of our times. He wasn't alone. There were many people like Bernays. One of the reasons we know about Bernays is because he wrote about himself. He was, a, unlike most PR people who like to keep behind the scenes, Bernays was a self-promoter. He wrote, uh, a book beyond these books he wrote in the 1920s, he wrote an autobiography, which was called the biography of an idea, um, essentially taking this whole idea of uh, propaganda and making it his own. But Bernays uh, was part of a generation of people who had worked in the military propaganda machine, which was called the Committee on Public Information during the First World War. And what happened during that time was people who were uh, media people, persuasion experts, uh, uh, publicists, journalists, filmmakers, uh, public speakers and so forth, all got um, recruited into the Committee on Public Information, which is called in the movie The Creel Commission, after the, the man who's, who was its leader. Um, the Creel Commission was, was dismantled seven days after the armistice. But you had a whole bunch of people who had come out of localized journalism, filmmaking, radio, et cetera, who now understood how to apply their craft uh, uh, on a grand national and international scale. And so you had the emergence during the 1920s of uh, what uh, one scholar of the field has called the compliance professions. Uh, Bernays was a representative of his time. He wasn't simply a lone individual. Uh, he was, the reason why I think he's become so prominent is because most of them knew better than to talk about what they were doing. But Bernays speaks to the present very much. And as I said, the young people I know who are working in, um, on, who in guerrilla marketing, uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, data market, data um, management, and so forth, these are people who are are looking to Bernays. It's that's the readership. It's why it's getting published again. You mentioned uh, Donald Trump and his his victory. Um, opened the gates to many questions, many debates that are at the heart of, of our uh, global discussions today about fake news, obviously, about manipulations, about post-truth, you know, these concepts came out of, of uh, uh, I mean, they existed, but they became a public debate uh, issue after Trump uh, won. Um, the alternative facts that was uh, w another one of those concepts. Uh, w what what is going on? What has Trump started? W you know, in, uh, when we're dealing with uh, Edward Bernays about uh, uh, manipulations, about uh, shaping public opinion. What what does uh, Donald Trump tell us about that? Well, the, I think one of the central things about uh, about Trump is that he's turned the world upside down. 
That is to say, truth has always happened to ideas. Journalism is not simply a uh, scientific gathering of data which is then presented to the public at large in a completely objective form. Journalism has always had motives and visions behind it. So, and a hundred years ago, the American philosopher William James wrote a book called Pragmatism, in which I talk about in PR, and I say I, I talked about in PR, I wrote that book 22 years ago, and look, here I am. Uh, uh, one of the things that he wrote in his book about pragmatism, he says, it was a chapter called Pragmatism's Concept of Truth. And in it, he says, the truth is, is, not, it doesn't, is not the result of something that is inherent within it. Truth happens to an idea. It is made truth through a process of presentation and verification. And it was an important insight because on the one hand, it was a very democratic idea, this idea that we should not accept the truths that have been passed on to us by popes and kings. But on the other hand, it opened up the idea that if truth can happen to an idea, then if you say it enough, it will become the truth. Now for a long time, in the United States, institutions like the, United, uh, like the New York Times, uh, CBS television, various other Washington posts and so on. These were institutions that carried the imprimatur of truth. I've been looking at the New York Times International Edition. It's very different than the one we get at home. Um, it's more critical in certain ways than the one we get at home. But also, one of the things that's missing from it is that on the top of the masthead of the New York Times, in the United States, on the left side, on the right side is the weather, and on the left side is a box which says all the news that's fit to print, okay? So what it means is that for a long time, there was these certain authorities who were looked to in certain ways as the, as the presenters, not of God-given truth, but of research-given truth. And, um, and um, they had a, there was a certain kind of arrogance that went along with that. It's very different than a place like France. We never had Liberation, okay? We never had um, a journalism that was truly diverse in terms of, um, it's just like we don't have parties that are truly diverse. We have two sides of the same coin in terms of the political system. So what Trump did was to, as I said, he flipped the world upside down. He turned the mainstream arbiters of truth into purveyors of falsehoods, which to some extent was true. I mean, the New York Times sold the Iraq war to the American people by presenting journalism that was packaged by the US military. And it was only two or three years after that began that they, they... They did an intense self-criticism for that. Yes, where they began to criticize themselves for, um, um, for purveying the idea about weapons of mass destruction and this, that, and the other thing. It was a puppet show. So, so um, what Trump understood was that if you have a system where there are always puppeteers involved in the presentation of news, and where particularly certain sectors of the American public felt very eliminated from or uh, amputated from the vision of truth that was being presented in those media, um, uh, it, it, was, it was very easy for many people to see the mainstream media, the commercial media, all of which work for the, biz, the business system, um, which had collapsed uh, 
um, internationally to some extent in 2008, to see the, the, that as a propaganda machine. And so he took the term propaganda or fake news, which is, I guess, another terminology, and, and shown it as a, as a spotlight on the mainstream media. Does that mean that in that narrative, Trump would be a, 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 like a, a resistor, a resistance movement to Edouard Bernays and the, and the um, uh, fabrication of consent? Uh, I don't think so. I think what he would do is understand Bernays better oh. than the New York <laughs> Times would have. Yeah, so uh, he, he took them at their own game. Well, you know, you were talking in the beginning about the terminology of propaganda and democracy. And there are a lot of these apparent contradictions that live within our world. I mean, there's a, a writer in uh, the United States who actually came and lived in Paris for a period of time, Tanahasi Coates, mm -hmm. who wrote a wonderful piece of journalism called The Case for Reparations, which is a history about policies that underpinned the systems of racism in the United States, and particularly regarding black folks. And one of the things he talks about there is the extent to which democracy and white supremacy were straight, were, were bedfellows. And I, that's, I think, probably true in France as well as in the United States. We're not very different. What? We're not very different. No, I mean, and colonialism and, imperi and U.S. imperialism are simply different moments in a, a long trend. So... Uh, the propaganda was developed because of democracy. Uh, Bernays was interested in, since people had the, uh, the, the, the arrogant idea that their ideas mattered and that their own thoughts mattered, uh, Bernays realized that old systems of rule no longer functioned. The aristocracy, the, high, the ecclesiastical hire, they were no longer relevant. And so what was necessary was the creation of unseen engineers who would use scientific tools, and he spoke about it this way, as a way of managing democracy so that people could believe that their own voices were being heard and at the same time executive power would be able to do what it wanted. At this, uh, 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 What Trump has done is that he has attached his politics to certain feelings that are widely prevalent in the United States. The, uh, going back to what I said about Coates, the idea of white supremacy is something that offered even the poorest white folks a sense of superiority, a sense of mattering in a way that other people, dark people, didn't matter it offered them a sense of importance. And part of what has happened in the period following, I would say, the Second World War, but very dramatically in the 50s and 60s and 70s, was that these previously submerged points of view all of a sudden began to gain a voice. Books were being published by people who previously were thought to be illiterate. Um, and Trump understood the resentment of that. And he himself is a product of that resentment. Trump's father, who was where he got the money from, was a real estate guy who banned black people from living in all of his housing projects, but who also marched with the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. In other words, Trump came from a family that was dedicated to white supremacy. So the ability to call Mexicans rapists and criminals is, is no different than what the Klan said about emancipated black people in the late 19th century. So Trump and what he does, and this is something that I assume you've seen, when Trump, he, unlike any politician I have seen, when Trump speaks, 
and he holds rallies all the time. I've never seen a president holding rallies every two days. And in these rallies, he goes to places which are friendly to, I would say, his ideas about giving power to the powerless, you know, defending white supremacy against the, the encro encroachment of otherness that was turning America into an unrecognizable place. And he, um, uh, he gives these speeches, but every time he gives a speech, he also recruits people to stand behind him. So whenever you see him in a rally, it's not just Trump at the podium, but you see hundreds of people behind him who have all been coached by an advanced person to cheer madly at everything he says, and who also have been, uh, I would say, uh, tattooed with small representations of diversity. So you will see one black face, uh, and that black face uh, is on top of a body that's wearing a white t-shirt that says, blacks for Trump. You'll see a couple of women, despite the kind of misogyny that runs through his movement, who are women for Trump. But for the most part, it is a bunch of truckers in red hats saying, make America great again, which, by the way, means to a lot of people, make America white again. Let's make America something that has done away with the history. So in many ways, um, um, this is the use of that symbolism of being a man of the people and actually having the people behind you on stage. I mean, that's remarkable. And whether it's done out of intuitive genius, or I, which I think is the case. I don't, he's not an intellectual. In fact, he appeals very deeply to the anti-intellectualism that is part of the lifeblood of, of American society. So would he be doing uh, Edward Bernays without having read Edward Bernays? He probably knows somebody who read Edward Bernays. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, but for the most part, his style is, you know, in, in uh, American popular culture, you all know this because of the movies. Uh, in American popular culture, there are two genres which have been dominant. One of them is the Westerner. And the thing of uh, John Wayne or others. And the, West, the thing about the, the Western is it highlights the individual who, who answers to no one but himself. And certainly is, you know, is in some way a representation of libertarian behavior, not just, um, and he'll kill anybody in his way, and that's part of the uh, ugly charm of the Western tradition. The other tradition is gangster movies. And Trump comes out of a gangster movie. Trump is, you have to realize, he came out of the building industry. Anybody who has, any, has spent enough time in New York to watch how the building industry works knows that the building industry historically, along with a few other industries like sanitation and so on, private sanitation, not public, um, have been run by the mafia or by other mob organizations. And so if you're gonna do business in New York, you need to know who to pay off. And you need to know who to trust and who not to trust. And there is a kind of sacred bond that begins to develop between those and the people you're paying off. And that sacred bond is predicated on the idea that you'll pay them off, but if they ever turn on you, you'll have them, you'll have them wiped out. Um, as people around Trump have begun under the investigation that's going on, turning on him. He's using mob language to describe uh, the people who are turning on him. You know, this guy's a loyal guy. He's a good guy, he's a good fellow. This one's a flipper. Um, I don't know how those translate into French. But this is the lingo of, of, of gangsterism. And 
And anybody who works in certain businesses in New York, and this is true for a long time, I grew up with these kids, okay? A lot of my friends, their fathers were gangsters. I grew up in Queens for a long period of time. This is where Trump comes from. It's a world that's permeated by gangsterism. Uh, I understand it instantly because I work at a university that is part of the city of New York political system. And I saw payoffs going on within the university where deans were handing money to obedient professors, you know, and for nothing. Just, you know, you and my friend, we have drinks together after work. Okay, here's 100,000 bucks. Have a good time. So it's part of the culture. And Trump appeals to that because in the gangster stories, just like in the Western stories, the murderers are always the heroes. Hmm. You know, the killers are always somewhat romantic. And the fact that he puts on a red baseball cap, which has become, you know, a sign of trucker culture, hmm. um, uh, which also is an industry, the Teamsters, sure. which has a long history of um, criminal association. And as what, um, what's turning out to be the case uh, is that he surrounded himself with, in draining the swamp. He surrounded himself, you know, with the, the swamp. One of the, one of the most striking aspects of today's American scene, from, seen from here at least, is the polarization, is the fact that uh, Americans don't read the same news, don't believe the same sources. You're either Fox News or New York Times. And, and, uh, and so the, the basis for society, for community, uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, is that something that Trump is using? I think it's something, first of all, that has been happening um, the minute they replaced fireplaces and homes with televisions, uh, which, by the way... You're, you're a great pessimist, then, huh? <laughs> I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. Because I think there is... Change is difficult. We talked about this the other night. Uh, we live in a world, certainly in the United States, where people are used to instant gratification. They want change, and they want it now. As a historian, one of the things you see is that change takes time. And I think that alongside of this division of society in, and the, the use of big data in order to uh, systematize that um, has been widely noted. But along with that, there is a widespread dissatisfaction with that. And so one of the things that has happened, whereas when Trump goes to Michigan or wherever he goes and has the crowd cheering behind, they've been coached to cheer behind him. When the reporters come to them and say, could he ever say anything that might upset you? People actually say, no, I believe everything he says. So this is not a group of people um, who are even democratically oriented. Um, they're people who are in love. Um, this is, you know, they have projected onto him the very things that they've been feeling but feeling embarrassed to say. Um, they project onto him the things they say missing from their own lives. But simultaneously, the, the population of the United States is changing. There's massive organiz organizing going on on the local level. People are meeting together in ways that I find very promising. Um, the fact that a socialist or f a few socialists have been uh, reached positions of power in the United States, this is something that has not happened in a hundred years, where there were a couple of... So, so Who are you referring to, to those who won uh, the, well, the, the... Alexander Ocasio-Cortez. Yeah, the, the primaries in the yeah. Democratic, yeah. Uh, for, the, for the midterm. Yeah, and in New York, no, a Republican is. I mean, that's the other thing about Trump that's so interesting. He is, he is hated in his own city. In other words, we've been, we've received a big dose of Trump uh, 
going back to the time where he was, you know, a playboy on the cover of the Enquirer magazine. Um, and um, uh, and um, people think very poorly of him. In certain ways, he, he fits a sort of American mythology of the city slicker who comes into small town America and hoodwinks, you know, the ordinary people. Only this time, the ordinary people like it. Um, but there are other things that are going on. I mean, there was a story, recent, rec not story, but a recent research into the population of the United States. Um, in, 19, in 2018, the percentage of the population that is foreign born is greater than it has been in the United States since 1910, which was in the middle of the great migration of um, people from the Mezzogiorno of Italy and from Eastern Europe and so forth. And those people were defiled as well. Mm -hmm. And Trump in certain ways is echoing um, the outlook of the anti-immigrant uh, forces powerful anti-immigrant forces of that time, the eugen people who were promoting eugenics as a way of trying to um, undermine the um, fertility of lower beings, and also attempts, very successful attempts, particularly aimed at black folks, to, um, uh, to discourage them or keep them, often violently, from voting. And that stuff is so in many ways, I think Trump is a throwback to the kind of demagoguery that Bernays was inspired by or that Gustave Le Bon was inspired by. He's not a technocrat. He's not somebody, um, okay. Uh, sorry, in, in the, in, but it's to, to follow on what you've just said. Um, in the last pages of your book, PR, you, you're, an optimist about the, the influence of education, about media literacy, about the fact that um, compared to, to the beginning of the 20th century, there is uh, obviously a, a, a much greater access to information, to knowledge to, that is more uh, democratic uh, and, and open. And, and then in the past 20 years, we have this feeling that we are going backwards. History doesn't just move forward. That's, a, that's part of the Enlightenment idea of progress. Um, but I would say two things, in, in one in, in terms of the, the last. If you're going to end a book about the powers of persuasion, you also want to, incur, and, and the, 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 the wire pullers who stand behind the instrumentation of persuasion, I think it's only fair to encourage your reader to believe that there is a possibility of something better. Because media studies, if it's only about all of the ways in which the media fuck with our minds, um, excuse me, <laughs> in America we would say, pardon my French, but, <laughs> but if that's all you do, then in certain, certain ways what you do is you encourage a sense of powerlessness. And one of the things about a sense of powerlessness is that it makes people powerless. So it's, a, it's critical for people to imagine their own potential power, not as individuals, but as people, as but, earthlings. Yeah. But media literacy is a very I interesting topic because, I mean, there's a, we're talking a lot about it in France. That uh, uh, the, the government announced that it was uh, doubling the, the budget for media literacy in schools, for example. Uh, it's seen as a way of countering fake news, conspiracy theories, and creating better citizens for the future. It, it, there's no real evidence that it works uh, when you look at the US. Well, first of all, um, we have to look at the question of literacy and what it means. Um, does it mean uh, 
as some people in in the in the uh, business sphere in the early part of the 20th to 20th century said that you needed to teach workers how to read so they could follow orders better. Um, literacy has a history. Most people historically have not had literacy. And the reason why literacy became an issue, particularly in social movements of the 19th century, 18th century, and even 20th century, was because literacy is not simply, when, when we're given literacy, or kids in the, in the 19th century were introduced to literacy, it wasn't so they would be able to understand all the lies that were being told to them in the books they read. In other words, yes, that's something you need to be able to look out for. You need to be able to understand the way in which rhetoric on the one hand, if properly used, um, can enlighten people. If improperly used, it can mask reality in ways that will have people acting against their own best interests. But literacy, the idea of literacy, and the movements for an affable, what's the term? An alphabetization, uh, the movement towards literacy, one of the reasons why it has been such a fundamental part of popular social movements is to broaden the, the universe of discussion. The idea was not just to learn how to read, but to learn how to write. And with the idea that learning how to write would in fact broaden the, um, the range of ideas that came to light. The ideas of people who have been historically uh, um, silenced by the re what we call the record of history. And so I think while it is true that we're in a dark time in terms of um, the development of uh, or the uses of mass psychology uh, to m mobilize people in ways um, that are very, di very dangerous, um, simultaneously this is a period of time where there's an explosion of writings that are giving voice to, uh, to ideas and that have not been heard before. I mean, I mentioned before ta Coates. His essay on the case for reparations takes the sort of institution of racism, the murder of black men by police, that's part of the everyday news, and says, wait a second. This is not just something that's happening now. It's something that's happening because there is a history of policies that ensured ghettoization of black people. And, and, and in certain ways, it's about making the present legible through providing people with historical memory. And I think this is kind of one of the tasks of literacy, and it's something that's happening. Look at, look at Jimmy's film. I mean, w uh, that's part of the universe of discussion. But I if I may, you, you've, you've been very critical of the media uh, in the US and, and that would apply to France or Europe uh, probably in the same way if you were living here. Uh, and, and some of that criticism is definitely legitimate and, and, uh, and is shared by many people. But at the same time, the, you know, the alternatives have not been uh, coming out. The social media were uh, seen at some stage, and I know because I, I you know, when we started our website, uh, Agnès was referring to Rue 89, we, we had this idea that uh, uh, people would take over uh, social media and produce uh, not necessarily alternative news, but uh, uh, a, a, a wider and a, and a better uh, way of news. This hasn't happened. No, it uh, hasn't. And, 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 and today, we are faced with a, a decredibilized, dec uh, well, less credible media. I'm not sure I invented a new word. Um, uh, less credible media and social media that have not uh, been, you know, that have become battlefields for uh, rival ideologies or hate groups. And so we're left with a, a less reliable and less uh, 
credible uh, news system. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the news system has, uh, on all sides, has contributed to that. Because the very fact that each day you need to pump out another newspaper and that it needs to contain stuff that is new. I mean, and Trump is great at this. Uh, one of the things that Gustav Le Bon talked about when he talked about leaders in the late 19th century, I'm sorry to go backwards mm -hmm. when you ask about the present, because I think memory is important. And I think the loss of memory yeah. and the kind of diminution of memory is one of the most dangerous things in our midst. When Ray Bradbury wrote his book, Fire, Fahrenheit 451, one of the things that had created that dystopic world was that nobody could remember anything. And the obliteration of memory is, so, so when Le Bon looked at um, the, the uh, leaders of the late 19th century, Paris Commune, which what really freaked him out, uh, uh, he said, well, the leaders, they speak as if in images, and each one is placed in front of the next one like a magic lantern show. And um, they have no connection to one another, and, um, um, but they seem to prov they, they have no logical connection to each other, but they become a sort of pseudo-narrative. That's what Twitter does. Twitter is the magic lantern show, and the fact that we have a president of the United States who is on Twitter 10 times a day is a way of creating constant distraction from the world at large. But let me, let me go back to what you said in your, the beginning. You said I'm a critic of the media. I am not a critic of the media. The media are tools of public expression. I am not a critic of the printing press. The printing press is something that can be used in emancipatory ways, and it can be used in repressive ways. And so the real question is, and I think this is the issue that, about literacy, that if we, mean, if we mean what we say about media literacy, media literacy needs to encourage a public, first of all, to be able to look not just at what the media information is or disinformation, but also how the very structures may keep them from achieving what they need in order to fulfill their democratic aspirations. And another thing that needs to be done is that uh, we need to break down the distinction between author and audience. In other words, it's in citizen journalism is something that has, a very, has had a very positive impact, certainly in the United States. Um, the murder of, uh, of Eric Garner by a policeman on the, uh, in Staten Island, that's been something that, that's part of the American story. Policemen have been killing black men as long as there have been free black men. And even when there weren't free black men, overseers were killing them. So this is part of the, but now you have people who put that stuff out there. I think people need to imagine themselves as citizen journalists, and they also need to understand ways of coming together as a community. In other words, when somebody says, what, I was, did an interview two days ago, and, 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 and the interviewer said to me, well, what would what you say to someone who said, I don't want to be manipulated? What would you say to someone who, uh, who, who said, I don't want to be manipulated? And I would say, as long as you view yourself as someone, you are susceptible to manipulation. It's only when, it's only when you understand yourself as an earthling, as part of a species that needs to discover itself once again. It's only when that happens that you can create media that are, in fact, uh, critical and interactive, not interactive online, but interactive in the streets. I mean, the, the streets are very important because when people come together in the streets, power shakes. When people come together online, uh, 
Uh, it's and the question, of course, again, is who controls the structure of the media, and who controls the the, the tech platforms, the text, tech, technical, the the, the, the technical the platforms, Facebook, yes. Google, uh, Twitter. Yes, and these are a man. Uh, one uh, of the uh, things <coughs> are the allies or enemies in in what you've just described. Well, I think it's interesting because if you look at Silicon Valley companies. And I would assume, I don't know, uh, I'm not conversant with the equivalent in, in France. But if you look at... We, do, we, we use Twitter, okay. Facebook. Uh, uh, okay. But uh, if you look at... Because the Chinese have developed yeah. alternatives. Um, yeah, they um, were smarter. <laughs> um, but uh, as long as... The people of Silicon Valley are these interesting contradictions. Um, they are very socially progressive. They tend to be socially progressive in terms of ideas of gender rights, in terms of uh, sexual orientation, in terms of all kinds of things. And they support, in many ways, quote unquote, liberal causes. With some, with one exception, the guy who's the head of PayPal is in Peter Trump. Thiel. Yeah, Peter Thiel is was at least a Trump supporter. But other than that, uh, these are people who were functionaries for Obama. But the thing is that they're staunchly libertarian, and they're staunchly libertarian in ways that, for example, when the government wants to regulate them in any way. Um, they take the same position that the oil industry takes. They take the same position um, that other global monopolies have taken going back to the early days of laissez-faire. And so you have a situation in which you have a kind of transnational corporatism, which is the economic mindset of Silicon Valley and the kind of what you might call lip service uh, to libertarianism um, that uh, functions um, on a more public level. But I was going to say, we'll just go back to a discussion before. Um, uh, the problem is that the people who are um, the owners, the captains of those industries, um, they understand the profit motive and they are driven by that. A lot of the people who work for them in terms of you, you know, uh, computer engineers and so forth are libertarians without necessarily identifying with capitalist motivations. And so you have a person like Edward Snowden who comes out of that world um, who, who who, who broke with the policies um, of, of the NSA, but also of Silicon Valley. But the Silicon Valley is the, the new backbone of American capitalism. Yes, that's what it is. And that's one of the reasons why when we talk about creating alternative media, we need to find other channels, we need to build other channels we need to probably go more low tech because high tech invariably is connected to money and power and sometimes uh, you know I, in the 1960s one of the things that happened in the midst of all of the activities that went on was the creation in France of the atelier populaire um, the, the, in the United States, the underground press, the military, even in the military, the foot soldiers, the people who uh, were executing the war on the ground started shooting their officers and started producing underground newspapers with mimeograph machines. But we're going the other way. I mean, Agnès was quoting uh, Yuval Harari. He... he he presents a, a future which is, uh, you know, artificial intelligence mixing with human brain and uh, and uh, a kind of um, uh, incredible 
tech future that is shaping our world and creating uh, different types of inequalities and, and, and struggles in this world. The question is, where do we find the alternatives? Now, part of the appeal of the brain-machine interaction is that there are certain people who are arguing that since our brains are simply computers, this comes out of Alan Turing, the computational theory of mind, where the, the, we view the, the, the computer simply as a, 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 a facsimile of the way in which the brain actually works. There's no evidence of that. In other words, if you want to understand a, an apartment building, looking at the electrical networks and the plumbing networks really doesn't tell you much about the life of what goes on in that apartment building. But part of the appeal of it, uh, or the part of the appeal of um, uh, the brain-computer interaction is that there are people who are arguing that in the future you will be able to have your brain uploaded to a, a drive of some kind and it will provide you with immortality. That is to say, your body will die, but your, your mind will continue and will be appended to a machine. Well, this, I mean, this is sort of uh, high-tech Christianity. You know, this is, this is the promise life, of... Life after life. Uh, the, uh, the promise or of an afterlife. Death. And um, I actually think um, one of the things that needs to be an urgent realization among people is their own mortality. Because once you embrace your own mortality, then you can find a sense of purpose within your life, what you do with your life. This is what your old boss, Jean-Paul Sartre, said, right? <laughs> life in and of itself only takes on meaning through engagement. Yeah. And I think that's true. And I think hoping for these technologically determined futures, there's nothing new about that. It's something that's been going on forever. It's been a long time I haven't heard someone quoting Jean-Paul Sartre, I must say. <laughs> um, uh, excuse me. I'm an old guy. <laughs> uh, we, we'll, we'll take a, a few questions from, from the audience in a few minutes. I have one last thing. I, I found this statistic which I found staggering. In 2000, there were 65,900 reporters in the US and 128,000 public relations uh, people. So one for two, more or less. In 2015, 15 years later, the number of reporters went down one third to 45,800. And the number of PR people went up to 200,000 and 18,000. So it's, it's now one reporter for almost five PR people. W what does it say about our world? It's, it's uh, I mean, as a journalist, I must say I find that completely scary and, and, and you know, mind-blowing. Well, I think it's scary, but it also tells you that the urgency to manufacture consent has become increasingly greater. And the urgency of working with an informed public has become something that the structures of power are less and less interested in. So, in other words, you can look at statistics like that in a variety of ways. One way is that, you know, uh, people are just not interested in understanding the world that they live in. And the other is that maybe people are interested in understanding their world, and so you need to put more engineers of consent on the ground in order to be able to deal with those desires. Because I don't, I don't feel that people have lost their inquisitiveness. And I don't think that people have lost their anger about the inequities of power. I, and I should say, although Trump, I mean, Trump is this front man who kind of puts on a circus that's visible in the media globally all on a daily basis. But behind the scenes, um, what's going on politically 
is horrific and is something that's been part of a conservative plan within the United States and I assume elsewhere for a long time, but they never had, you know, the carnival barker uh, before who could stand in front of the crowd and keep them distracted from the issues of their lives because uh, economic inequality is growing. Um, the repression of popular sovereignty and voting is growing. Um, the wages of blue collar people are stagnant while the, the income of the very wealthy, uh, not just the 1%, but probably the 10%, um, you know, ensures um, that you have an upper middle class who will be the front people for conservative politics. But meanwhile, you have people in Appalachia who've been out of work, who are s struggling with health issues, obesity, I mean, all kinds of problems, uh, who are being um, led by the nose by this carnival barker. So, uh, you know, I'm, I think that there are very real, and I think that the very, th I have run into people who have said, I would have voted for Bernie Sanders, but I, instead I voted for Trump because I didn't have a chance. Um, and I think that's a sign of how manipulable people may be, and they don't can't tell the difference between one or the other. Um, but it's also that there is this sort of repository of upset and feeling of being robbed of one's birthrights um, that can lead in different directions. What we're seeing right now is that led to the, the election of the impossible president. But you could, if you watched his rallies as early as 2015, it wasn't hard to see that he would become president because of the stuff that he brought out in people. You know, this telling people to, to beat up on anybody who criticizes him. Yeah, go. In the old days, we would have led them out on a stretcher. In the old days, oh, go ahead, hit him in the head. I would like to punch you in the face. This is the president speaking. I would like to punch you in the face. And you know what? Punch him in the face. If you get a law, if a lawsuit comes up against you, I'll get you my lawyer. Well, his lawyer is now up in charges, so it's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. We must have some microphones if si vous avez des questions. Alors moi je vois pas grand chose donc euh, j'ai le projecteur dans le visage. Est-ce qu'il y a Personne n'ose s'exprimer. Ah si, il y a une question au milieu. Comments anything. Uh, hi, uh, you were saying in, in a film that um, um, that uh, that uh, people who, who who started with this propaganda that, that they are not going to see the end of it. That is go, going to go for generation and generation. Who you do you think the the pair of this thing were, were? If you understand what I mean, in a f in in. Mais, euh, je ne suis pas français, mais je peux poser une question en français. <rire> C'est un peu compliqué. Dans, dans le film, vous avez dit que, le, que, que le, 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 les, les gens qui ont, qui ont, qui ont, qui ont, qui ont, qui ont fait la, qui ont payé pour, pour, pour certaines choses de, de propagande, on, on, ça va aller dans, 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 pendant les générations. Euh, je, je ne sais pas si, si, si vous avez pensé à quelqu'un en particulier ou pas. That's an important question, in part because uh, more progressive tendencies within our societies tend not to think across generations, where we, we, we have this desire for instant gratification. But I would say, um, if you want to talk about, in 1936, when FDR runs for president, he makes war against the business class. He calls them you know, the economic royalists. 
and that we're going to take their power away from them. You'll see a little bit of that in the film. And so beginning in the late 1930s, you have the coming together of various organizations. One of them mentioned in the film is the National Association of Manufacturers, which continues to be a major power in the United States. You have the Chamber of Commerce, which continues to be a major power in the United States. You also have a group of people who are interested in creating an identification between Christianity and God and capitalism. It's one of the reasons why on American Money it says, in God we trust. That was something that started being promoted in the 1930s. It didn't reach the dollar bills until the 1950s. And you also had the development of organizations like the Pellerin Society or the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago who were interest, who saw the the uh, vitality of capitalism and the longevity of capitalism as being in danger. And they laid out plans that um, were, as I call it in the, in the movie, the long game. In other words, even if we do not live to see what we are creating, we need to create it and, and trust in the fact that it will achieve its goals. Well, one of the people to answer your question more directly, who was recruited by initially by the National Association of Manufacturers was a young Hollywood actor by the name of Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan during the 1940s became a spokesperson for, um, a, a, for example, against a national health care system, which was about to be passed. He then went to work for General Electric. We go, he had a tutor, a person who would, would train him on, on these trips. And he would go from factory to factory arguing against unionism. And, um, became, and General Electric would, became one of the first major companies to uh, um, develop strategies for union busting. Um, Reagan then went on uh, to television in the 1950s for General Electric. He, had a, he was the host of a program called, Gen called uh, uh, the General Electric Theater, and the, the motto of the program was um, uh, General Electric, where progress is our most important product. By uh, the 60s and 70s, he's been elected to the governorship of California. And in 1980, as you all know, becomes the president of the United States. And by the way, uses the engineering of consent in ways that were at least a premonition of um, Trump. He, was, he, was, he didn't have the kind of hard edge that Trump has, but he had very similar politics and represented similar politics. So that's an example of ideas that began to percolate in the 1930s that finally achieved state power on the presidential level in the 1980s and which I would say have continued incrementally since then, particularly when you have, for example, the Democratic Party breaking from the very sort of tradition of social welfare programs that had been uh, the, the legacy of, of the New Deal. So um, I, I certainly would view Ronald Reagan and now his sort of idolized ghost um, as a example of thinking about the long game. Where do you draw the line between uh, the, the, this idea that there is this engineering uh, that is... Uh, uh, long-standing and, and very efficient, and the conspiracy theories, uh, where if, if we are indeed manipulated somewhere, why aren't we manipulated on everything? And maybe no one went to the moon, maybe there was not 9-11, uh, maybe, you know, all, all the theories that, that go around. Where, where do you draw the line, and how do you define that line? Well, I, I, have a, I have a whole problem with the, with the phrase, 
conspiracy theory. Because anybody who has studied history knows that there are and have been conspiracies. I mean, the papacy was driven from Rome and sent to Avignon hundreds of years ago by a conspiracy. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln, while they were only successful in killing Lincoln, was a conspiracy to wipe out the leadership of the Union government um, by people who were former Confederates. The term conspiracy theory, I think, entered into this um, muddy world of, uh, and I, by the way, I don't think you can study history without acknowledging that people get together in rooms, some in, on Madison Avenue. As and, we are doing now. Yeah, <laughs> well, this it was completely planned. <laughs> um, in fact, neither of us are actually here. If you notice, each of us has a small key behind our right ear, and we were wound up sort of on the way down into the theater. Um, and my spring is running out, actually. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, after, J after Kennedy was assassinated, um, there were all kinds of quote unquote theories about who did it. And of course, the official government position was in tune with American individualism. It was a lone gunman. There was no conspiracy. Don't look at the man behind the curtain, you know. It was a lone gunman who, who conveniently happened to be killed days after he functioned as a lone, lone gunman so that he could never divulge any of what might have motivated him. And so you had all people, all kinds of people, often without much information, speculating on the fact that the killing of a president probably is not something that happens without some previous discussion. Um, and so the term conspiracy theory became a euphemism for you know, crazy ideas. Um, well, I think that the way we can tell the difference is through inquiry. In other words, just as, I mean, one of the things that for me is distinguishes good journalism from crackpot journalism is that good journalism is based on research where you look around, you dig, you look under the rocks, just like good history, you go through the garbage. You look for the stuff that it's a, like detective work. And, you, and I think people need to be able to s recognize that. But I think that the fact that the term conspiracy theory has gets thrown around promiscuously um, as a way of describing even Trump. You know, Trump is filled with all these conspiracy theories. He saw a bunch of um, Arabs on top of a building in New Jersey who were cheering, you know, when the World Trade Center went down. Well, he didn't see it. He wasn't in New Jersey. But, and that's stuff that can be found out. But I think wiping out the idea that groups of people function in concord with each other um, in conspiracies, I don't think it's a healthy thing for us to ignore the way in which interconnected interests function in history. Oui. Non, non, mais attendez, il y a un micro qui arrive, c'est plus, c'est nécessaire. <laughs> Donc, je voulais faire un petit retour en arrière sur la psychologie des, des lois bernaises. Bon, c'est un petit peu loin de, du sujet actuel. Parce que simplement, cet homme-là, il était assez intelligent, il avait tout pour lui, et il s'est mis au, au service de causes qu'apparemment, il ne pouvait pas partager. Parce que faire la guerre contre l'Autriche la, la, et l'Allemagne, qui étaient ses pays d'origine, où il avait de la famille, c'était déjà assez dé délicat. Faire manger du bacon et des œufs, je ne pense pas qu'il qu devait en manger lui-même, pour différentes raisons. Et la promotion de la cigarette, je ne pense pas non plus qu'il fumait. Alors, finalement, qu'est-ce qui, qu qui pousse un homme à se mettre au service du, du pouvoir Est-ce que c'est une espèce d'ivresse du pouvoir par procuration C'est ça la question que je me pose. Alors, l'autre question, 
qui est plus, qui est plus vaste, qui est autour, c'est le contrôle des populations. Donc le contre, en France, contrairement aux états unis on a un État central fort. Donc la population est contrôlée depuis toujours, de, de, disons depuis trois siècles. Ce qui n'est peut-être pas le cas, le cas aussi efficacement aux états unis C'est peut-être pour ça que la démocratie américaine est peut-être plus efficace, d'une certaine manière, que la française. Et, mais actuellement, grâce à, donc, au GAFA, donc, euh, donc je ne sais pas si c'est assez clair, la Silicon Valley, donc nous avons maintenant une espèce de contrôle général de la population en temps réel, qui est absolument extraordinaire. Et dernier point, quand vous, quand vous avez évoqué l'immortalité de, de l'âme, en vérité, c'est déjà fait, puisque tous nos faits et gestes, nos moindres pensées, nos moindres hésitations, sont enregistrés en permanence. Donc, il n'y a pas besoin de payer pour ça. On le fait tous les jours, à tout moment. Merci. You've asked a lot of good questions in the midst of your question. Um, yes, I think he was intoxicated by the idea of controlling people. Uh, his daughter. Anne Bernays, who's in the film and who also I know, uh, would sit at the table and say that uh, everybody was stupid. You're stupid, he would say to his daughters. Uh, and so he believed um, that the intelligent few had a responsibility to democracy in order to ensure that the stupid masses um, could behave. And um, there was a lot of money involved. In other words, what makes people uh, promote war against his country of origin? First of all, he was not, uh, I, uh, Bernays was not a major figure in the Committee on P Public Information. This is his retelling of the story. Uh, Walter Lippmann, and um, a guy named Arthur Bullard, who were both advisors to President Wilson, were the people who came to him. Uh, Wilson wanted to use force to shut down all opposition. And Lipman and Bullard argued that we needed to create a propaganda bureau, and they became the architects of it. And they also chose a man named uh, George Creel to head up the commission. George Creel had been a journalist who had done exposés of the Rockefeller's murder of miners at Ludlow, Colorado. So he was known as a critic of business, which was a very smart move in a war that was uh, often being criticized as a businessman's war. So Bernays was a functionary within there. He certainly wasn't somebody who was an architect of the war. Uh, against uh, Austria. He was, like many American intellectuals, the twilight, he was part of the twilight of the idols. You know, the, the people, the intellectuals who came into compliance with the war effort. Um, in terms of what you said about immortality, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and that is that there is a record that is being maintained. It used to be that people were either dead or alive, and then they became recorded, okay? So which is kind of an intermediary place. And I know this because I was mentioning to uh, Pierre before that when my father was dying, he was a very visual person and he went blind. And so my mother bought him a little tape recorder, and he would speak into the tape recorder every day about his bowel movements, about him being nauseous, about his dreams, about not wanting to feel morbid, about memories of him and his father going to the, the baths downtown on the Lower East Side. And um, my son, who's an editor, put this together into a CD, so each of these little memories got turned into a, like a cut on the CD. And I had it on my iPod, and I was going to visit a friend. And um, I'm listening to music, and all of a sudden, I hear my father speaking into my ear. 
and it was incredible. And I went to see this man who uh, was a, a colleague of mine, and I said to him, Matt, you know, the, the weirdest thing just happened to me. I was listening to music, and then all of a sudden, my father started speaking to me, and I could hear his breath, and I could hear his voice, and it was so different than looking at a photograph, which is frozen and dead. It was actually, and so I understand that there is a kind of immortality that is possible through the, and he, he went on and on to me. He, he told me, he said, you know, my, my father died when I was 13, and I would give all of my photographs if I could have one recording of him speaking to me. So there's no question that there is this intermediary ground. But I think that what's different about the immortality that you're talking about, which is the kind of recorded data, is it, it's, all about, it's all about turning subjects into objects. In other words, the immortality is the immortality of an object. The subjectivity is gone. And I think that the myth that is being promoted about the kind of transfer of the brain onto a hard drive is about maintaining subjectivity, that your mind, your consciousness will continue. Um, and in this case, consciousness simply becomes a, a raw data to be exploited for other people's purposes. So I wouldn't quite call it immortality in the sense, um, say, that some people wish for it. Thank you for this uh, piece of uh, personal testimony. It was uh, very, very, very meaningful to our topic also. Uh, we're going to stop that here before your machine stops. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Yes. Uh, and thank you, uh, everybody, for this uh, great talk. And, and let me say to everybody that this is one of the great pleasures of my life to be here with you. Um, I, am, I am a man in his middle 70s, and to know that you know ideas that I've been wrestling with since I was very, very young still matter, are still relevant, um, is, it's not about immortality, it's about engagement, it's about the purpose in life that um, your old friend Sartre uh, wrote about. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being Merci. here.